What are we discussing on today's podcast, you ask? Well, we got to start with Dre Jameson's season debut as a starter. Break down the good and bad from that game. Discuss the offense coming alive once again. And then let's do a little preview for the D-backs next series against the Miami Marlins. Madison Bumgarner, <laughs> Madison Bumgarner is on the bump. So let's discuss all that and so much more on today's Lock on Diamondbacks podcast. You are locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Lock on Dimebacks podcast, part of the Lock on Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, MillerThomas24, that my portfolio.com. I think you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter at CreatorsThomas24 for my personal account or just look up Locked on Dimebacks on both Twitter. Instagram for the podcast handle. And please hit subscribe on the Locked on Dimebacks YouTube channel. We are slowly climbing to 500 subscribers. So please hit subscribe on there. And thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I'm not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. And I really do appreciate you guys because I be checking my numbers and rankings. I get a little bit too obsessed sometimes. And I was looking at the chartable rankings Pretty recently, and Croatia, my friends down in Croatia, have been going crazy for the Locked on D-backs podcast. It's currently like top 300, not just among baseball podcasts, not just among sports podcasts, but all podcasts in general. I feel so honored to be that high in Croatia, so please, I might need to take a trip out there this summer to go check it out because I love my international travels, and I might need to go meet some friends in Croatia this summer. But let's get back into the podcast and discuss this game, this series finale, D-backs versus Brewers, because the D-backs take down the Brew Crew 7-3, to and the D-backs now have the second most wins in the National League, tied with the Brew Crew at 8. The D-backs, if you can believe this, are 8-5, and five, and you know what? The most impressive thing from that record, the D-backs have yet to to lose a series this season and I know that doesn't sound that crazy but you got to think about the competition that they're going against this year because we think about that they played the pot the, the almost said the Padres the Dodgers in the first game then they played the Padres in the second game Dodgers again and then the Brew Crew entering the season I didn't have major expectations for them but still they were through 10 games of the season, looking like a juggernaut where one of the better teams in Major League Baseball was leading that division, you know, tied for the most wins in the National League at the time, facing off against the D-backs. And the D-backs, once again, humbled another team in the National League that we might have had high expectations for. So the D-backs are looking good to start the season. And you want to know how long it was before the D-backs won their first series last year? Well, their first series last year was against the Padres. They lost that series. Second series was against the Houston Astros, which they split. Third series against the Mets, which they lost. Then against the Nationals, they split a four-game series. They played the Mets again, lost that. Then they played the Dodgers and actually won that series, which was their first series win of the season last year. So I don't think the D-backs got their first series win until their sixth series last season against the LA Dodgers so the D-backs so far this year yet to lose a series through their first four D-backs didn't win their first series last season until their sixth series of the year and the D-backs were able to win this series finale against the Brew Crew on the backs of of Dre Jameson, who looked great as a starter in his season debut. The offense coming alive for seven runs and really going after the Brew Crew, starting pitching the bullpen, it really didn't matter. And the D-backs overall using extra base hits, using power, and they did that all without Tori Lovello managing them because the umpires have been on a power trip this season, throwing out dudes who 
want to argue balls and strikes. And listen, I was pro Manny Machado getting thrown out because he was trying to argue a pitch clock violation thing and Toy Lavelle wanted to argue calls. Like, I'm okay with dudes being thrown out. I just want to make sure if you're throwing someone out, it's egregious because I didn't think it was egregious what happened to Manny Machado. I don't think he should have been thrown out, but I do think it was justified. Same with Toy Lavelle. I don't think he should have been thrown out, but was it justified? Sure. But let's actually talk about the good from this series finale against the Brew Crew. The first good that I want to talk about, of course, just let's start off with Dre Jameson talk because Dre Jameson, of course, has been coming out the bullpen, has been coming out of, of the D-backs pen in relief and has been looking really good, right, as a reliever so far for the D-backs this season. And he's been one of our most electric relievers when you look at his stuff, when you look at his pitching arsenal. And he put that all on display against the Brew Crew. And this start against, uh, against the Brew Crew, he might have had his best stuff of the season because you just look at his pitches in terms of velocity. Like, he threw the sinker ball more than any other pitch. He threw that 50% of the time. But what was really interesting when looking at his, like, stat cast breakdown, his slider gained 2.3 miles per hour. His fastball was up a half mile an hour as well. His changeup was up 1.2 miles per hour. Like, Dre Jameson was throwing hard in this ball game and he was making dudes miss he didn't rack up a ton of strikeouts he had four and four innings but he was racking up some whiffs some called strikes and dre jameson overall i just thought it looked really good looked in control and yeah could he could he have gone deeper into the ball game sure he only had 56 pitches through four innings with the three hits allowed no walks allowed so he definitely could have gone deeper into the ball game but toy lavello talked about how we want to look out for his long-term health don't want to put too much on his plate in his first start of the season. So just being a little precautionary with the Dre Jameson, but I love the way he looked in his starting um, debut for the D-backs this season. And like I said on yesterday's podcast, like if he gets another crack in the rotation, another turn, and he looks good again, you – you know, uh, extend the leash a little bit, maybe goes five, six innings, and he looks dominant once again. Like, I do think it's a real conversation about keeping Dre Jameson in the rotation, and I don't know if you move Ryan Nelson to the bullpen then. I don't know if you go with a six-man rotation, maybe have a hard conversation with Zach Davies or Madison Bumgarner, but another turn through the rotation where Dre Jameson looks like this, I do think we have to have a real conversation about keeping him in the rotation. The second thing that I want to discuss from this game that I really like was the power and the extra base hits that the D-backs displayed in this game because the D-backs really took it to town against the Brew Crew starting pitcher. And I think it's kind of funny that his last name was Junk because that's the stuff that he was throwing today. Just straight up Junk. He wasn't really that effective. It really felt like the D-backs lineup was keying in on him pretty easily because you just look at some of the just the box score overall. I mean, the D-backs had 12 hits in this game, and Guriel had a double. Rojas had two doubles. Alec Thomas had two doubles. And then Guriel and Carroll both homered each. So you had a whole bunch of extra base hits in this game. And if you look at the exit velocity for some of these D-backs batters that did have good games in this, Josh Rojas on his plate appearances averaged a 90.8 exit velocity. Ketel Marte was at 91 Lords Guriel was at 90.3. Corbin Carroll was at 102.4. Like Alec Thomas was at 102.6. Like a lot of these D backs players in the lineup were at 90 plus mile an hour exit velocity. Every time they swung the bat, the ball was just flying off their bat. Jason Junk, or not Jason Junk, but the whole Brew Crew pitching staff in this game gave up about a 38% hard hit percentage. So the D back just did a great job offensively of getting the barrel to the ball and elevating the ball and just making great contact overall like I really just like how some of these D-backs players look in the lineup right now Josh Rojas three for four once again just looks locked in as the leadoff hitter slash line right now 412 447 559 Rado Perdomo two more hits for him he's batting 409 we have 536 OBP and a 682 slugging. I like the fact that Alec Thomas is starting to heat up as well. So, like, this whole lineup, Lords Guriel, the guy we acquired in that Dalton Varsho trade, like, Gabriel Moreno was the headliner, but everyone was pro Guriel because he's a legit major league veteran, above average ball player, knows how to have good at bats, and just is a solid player all around. He's just a positive player to have in your lineup. So, the D backs, the offseason, Mike Hazen moves have all worked out so far. This D-backs team was 
they didn't come into the season with a lot of expectations. Like we want them to be near 500 improved from last season, but they were a team that was considered maybe sneaky, a dark horse team. That was one of those teams. I was like, you can't sleep on the D backs they are going to be feisty. And if you sleep on them, then they could knock you out in a series. And so far through the first 13 games this year, through the first four series this year, D-backs are looking good, and I'm feeling mighty fine about the D-back season so far. But again, small sample size. We're not going to get too far ahead of ourselves, but like we've been saying on the podcast, it's never too early to win games. And if you want to win with your car, then you need to check out eBay Motors because for a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, You'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the podcast and let's discuss, like I said on previous podcasts, some games there's more good than bad. I think on our most recent podcast, we had more bad than good with the broken up no-no and Corbin Burns almost going to complete game shutout. But after a game like this where the D-backs offense looks great, the pitching looks great, there's more good to talk about from this game. The more good that I want to talk about, I want to start here. The bullpen looked fantastic. Fantastic, except for one guy who we're going to talk about a little bit later in this podcast. But the bullpen was really strong in today's game because in that most recent loss to the Brew Crew, the bullpen, whoever came in, was seemingly giving up runs. But in this game, with Dre Jameson going out after just four innings, like the D-backs bullpen had to hold it down. And it was a little bit easier to take Dre Jameson out after four innings, knowing he had a four-run lead already built up. And by the end of the fourth, the D-backs are actually up five runs, so it was a little bit easier to take Dre, Dre Jameson out in that scenario. But the bullpen came in after him and just shut the door and was basically perfect, except for one guy that we'll talk about later. But Kevin Ginkle came out. He walked the guy, but he also had a strikeout. No earned runs. Kyle Nelson, 1.1 innings pitch, three strikeouts. No earned runs. Andrew Chafin, one inning pitch. No earned runs. And he, Andrew Chafin, five pitches to get through his one inning. Miguel Castro, he gave up a couple hits. He looked shaky a little bit once again. I was getting a little nervous with Miguel Castro there, but no earned runs. And then Scott McGuff, one walk, one strikeout, no earned runs. So that's one, two, three, four, five relievers. We saw six relievers in total. We'll get to that last guy in a minute, like I said, but we saw five relievers, six in total. But five of the six came in after Dre Jameson and just put zeros up on the board. Maybe they gave up a hit. Maybe they walked somebody. But the most important stat, zero earned runs. Love how the D-backs looked today from a bullpen standpoint because there's some games where the D-backs bullpen does its job. Your starter goes five or six innings and the bullpen comes in and just has shutdown after shutdown inning. And then there's some games where it just feels like nothing's going right. You have that Merrill Kelly implosion in the seventh. Then all the relievers that come in after that just continue to follow the train and continue to give up runs as well. But that did not happen in this game. I thought for a second, maybe the Brew Crew were going to come back, but the rest of the relievers was able to shut down their offense and Listen, the Brew Crew's offense coming into this series against the D-backs was pretty good. Like, a lot of their players who you don't really know were going off. Like, the Garrett Mitchells, a lot of their rookies, like Garrett Mitchell still has a 632 slugging. Brousseau has a 529 slugging. Willie Adamas has a 500 slugging. Brian Anderson has a 571 slugging. Like, a lot of these D-backs, excuse me, a lot of these Brew Crew lineup players were going off entering this series, and the D-backs Pitching staff was able to do a pretty good job of quieting the Brew Crew in this series offensively, and they were definitely able to do that in the finale thanks to the help of Dre Jameson and the bullpen. Absolutely love it. 
Real quick, another thing that I love with just the ghost runner, right? There was that one point in the game where the Brew Crew catcher threw it down to second because they thought a D-backs runner was stealing second. That was not the case. You're just so nervous whenever a D-back speedster gets on base because you just know he's going to take off. And the Brew Crew catcher got a little bit overzealous and just threw it over the second baseman's head with no one there. So if you're talking about ghost runners, that was a, a legitimately ghost. That was a legit ghost runner in the middle of a ball game. And then the last thing that I like that I want to talk about from this game before we get into a little bit of bad, we got the starter out early in five of the last six games, opposing starters against the D-backs don't go past five innings. And that means the D-backs offense is finally starting to come around after the first six games of the season, five, six games of the season, the D-backs offense look kind of slow. But now you look at the last five or six games of the season and the D-backs offense is really starting to explode a little bit because you got your seven runs today. Of course, they didn't look good against the Brew Crew in game two. They only scored three runs in game one against the Brew Crew. But those last three games against the Dodgers, six runs, 12 runs, 11 runs, and then you scored seven runs today. So basically six or more runs. And four of your last six games, that's pretty good if you're a D-backs team and you love the combination of your pitching staff doing well with your offense doing well, like that's always the perfect kind of game when you could go to a ballpark and see your team score seven runs, extra base hits galore, home runs galore, and your starters on the mound just putting and work, dotting up the strike zone and just getting K after K. Nothing is better as a fan than witnessing that from your team. But before we go in segment number two, let's talk about a little bit of bad from this game because there was a sprinkle of unfortunate misfortune bad luck in this game the first thing that i want to talk about that I did not like but it, it's bittersweet actually it's you do like it and you don't like it for uh let me just get into it right the toy lavello ejection it's something you like and don't like at the same time because you love the players talk about it. josh rojas said he loved it because toy lavello is a laid back guy and whenever he gets amped up chippy with the umpire i think it's just always great i i'm not gonna lie i do love seeing your umpire get fired up i like it a little bit better when it's later in the game as opposed to early in the game but i love it when your umpire gets fired up he gets all red he looks like a tomato and just gets in the face of an umpire just starts cussing him out you see the spit flying going all over in the face of an umpire he puts his finger in his face he starts to wag him out around like he's dikembe mutombo like i do love a good old-fashioned argument between a manager and an umpire especially when some of those like old school managers like back in the day if you go on youtube like i forgot what the yankees guy was or some of the other managers of the past like the ones who picked up bases and threw those or threw garbage cans on the field like i just love it when a manager goes over the top like i know we're trying to speed up the game and stopping with you know we we don't want to check the batting gloves a million times but i don't mind the extra delay in a baseball game for a manager to yell at the umpire i don't want players to argue about balls and strikes but manager especially one that's like old 60 plus got the white hair maybe balding on top whenever whenever the bald manager turns red and starts yelling at the umpire i am just elated every single time so i want to see more of that so i have this down as bad Tori Lovello getting ejected because you never want to see your manager ejected that that's just inherently going to hurt your team but it's also kind of a love because I love seeing Tori Lovello fired up the second bad that I said we we're going to talk about just Luis Frias I mean my god this guy again just phenomenal talent you see it with Luis Frias four seamer average about 98 miles per hour like 97 and a half. His cutter was around 93. Slide around 85. He's got very good spin rates on those numbers as well. Like the stuff is there for Luis Frias. The issue is he just gives up way too much contact. He doesn't have a lot of control. And it was kind of a, what was he doing? Giving up hit after hit? What what exactly was Luis Frias doing? Let me look at the box score real quick. Because Luis Frias didn't get an out. He gave up three hits three earned runs and a walk. Like it was the complete Luis Frias experience in terms of it being a negative experience because some experiences with the, the, the real full Luis Frias experience is him not completing it out, giving up the three earned runs, giving up three hits and a walk, but also somehow getting two strikeouts at the same time. Like he doesn't record it out, but somehow he would still get two strikeouts on a, a wild pitch, something like that, because that's something Luis Frias would do. So again, the dude, he's got the stuff. He's electric, but he just keeps his stuff over the middle of the zone. And these batters, despite how nasty his stuff are, are never fooled. So Luis Frias, he is under the bad for this 
game. And I also put Dre Jameson only going four innings bad as well, but we know why. The D-backs didn't want to overwork him, didn't want to put too much on his plate. So even though I put that as a bad, personally, I would like to see more Dre Jameson. I think we will. If he gets one more crack in the rotation, I do think we'll see a little bit of a longer leash from Dre Jameson. So I'm not too upset that he only went four innings today. But D-backs, a lot more good than bad in this series finale. And in the series as a whole, yeah, it was a good series for D-backs fans. And something that's really good, financially to help you and your wallet your bank account is rocket money because did rocket money alert you to a change in your spending or subscriptions that saved you money because rocket money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, and chances are you're one of them. Like that Stars app, just to watch that one show, or that free gaming trial you never use, Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you. And for any of you that don't want to pay for them anymore, you just hit cancel, and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. Rocket Money also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash MLB. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. Rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. And of course, I need to talk to you guys about Built Bar because if you're looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories that you need to be tasting the best protein bar ever, Built Bar. Because if you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices but don't want to compromise on taste, then I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars and Built Bar Puffs because Built Bars are healthy and taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so amazing, you won't even know that they're good for you because the thing about Built Bars is they're covered in 100% dark chocolate. That's right, dark, real chocolate. They're soft, they're easy to chew, they're low calorie, they're low sugar, they're high protein, they're high fiber, and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. And now you don't need to wait to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club while you can still get your specialty flavors still at Built.com. So don't worry. You can go online or in person. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate bar, or coconut puff of your closest sam's club run in and grab a 13 bar box of our hit flavors brownie batter puff and churro puff you can thank me later all right all right all right let's get back into the podcast and let's wrap it up by discussing a little bit of this next series for the d-backs d-backs versus the miami marlins and the marlins doing these crossovers with Sully baseball they're kind of been the darling of Sully Baseball's eye because I think he's picked the Marlins to be a wild card team. And for me, I kind of view the Marlins like I view the D-backs. Like they're at least coming into the season. Coming into the season, I was like, I don't love their lineup. I don't think they're going to score a lot of runs, but their pitching staff is going to be great. They're going to be in a lot of ball games. They're going to be feisty, but they're probably going to lose a lot of games like four to three just because they can't score enough runs. But I do think they're probably a mid to upper 70s win team and going to improve from last season. Meanwhile, Sully Baseball thinks they're going to be a wild card team and a better team than the D-backs. I disagree there. But so far this season, the Marlins offense is bad. If you look at like MLB, scoring ESPN, MLB, filter the National League team stats, runs, average, OPS, doesn't matter what it is. Marlins are like bottom three in everything. But the most shocking thing about this Marlins team, they're pitching, which we thought was going to be good because they have like seven dudes in that rotation I like. Their pitching has been bad, one of the worst in the National League this season. So now we're going to see Madison Bumgarner versus Trevor Rogers, And we know Mad Bum hasn't been good this year. But Trevor Rogers, someone who finished second Rookie of the Year voting a couple years ago, hasn't really looked good since his Rookie of the Year. And I guess since, like, what, 
maybe late July, August of his Rookie of the Year campaign. He really hasn't looked that good. So let's dive into this matchup a little bit and dive into the numbers because Mad Bum on the season, we know, just hasn't looked good. And I probably slander Mad Bum a lot, but I think it's kind of justified. Is it harsh to say he's washed? I've definitely said on the podcast before, but listen, I just don't think Mad Bum is in his prime anymore, which we can all see. I just don't think he's good anymore. I don't think he probably should be in a rotation at this point of his career. But the money owed to him is why he's still out there every fifth day pitching, even though we know he's holding back the rotation because on the season, Mad Bum season averages 8.2 innings pitch, 9 hits, 7 earned runs, 10 walks, and 3 home runs allowed. Like his more walks and hits allowed than innings pitch, which is just a terrible stat to have. Righties, or remember, Mad Bum's a lefty, so righties are batting 261 with a 996 OPS against Mad Bum. You're thinking, oh my god, righties are absolutely lighting up Mad Bum, but that makes sense because that's that cross matchup advantage that righties have against the lefty and Mad Bum, but guess what? Lefties against Mad Bum, 333 average with a, over a 1200 OPS, so lefties are actually crushing Mad Bum way more than righties are and especially early in the game that's where mad bum really seems to struggle i mean we know he's not going deep into the ball games but innings one through three he's allowing a 304 average but after that that's like a 220 average allowed so if he could get past the third inning he's typically not going to give up as many hits but it's also kind of hard for mad bum to get past the third because usually after three he's got five walks allowed and like three earned runs so it's like ah I think he's got 80 pitches through three innings. I don't know how much deeper in the ball game he's going to go. And the worst pitch he's had this year is his changeup. It's probably his fourth most used pitch, but when he does use it, I mean, it's been literally atrocious as a pitch because I don't even know how you can calculate those expected stats, but I know when your expected batting average on a changeup is over 600, that's bad, and you're you're going to need to sit down for this one. The expected slugging on Mad Bum's changeup this season has been over 2,200. That's not for an OPS, just on his expected slugging percentage, over 2,200. So his changeup has been far and away not effective this season. But he's going against another lefty in Trevor Rogers, who also hasn't been great this year. It hasn't been great for a while. And He's one that's not very good with pressure because when you have runners in scoring position, he allows a 919 OPS this season. He's really bad with two outs and runners in scoring position. If it's a tie ball game, his numbers aren't great. If it's a one run ball game, his numbers aren't great. The biggest thing that Trevor Rogers has going for him is that he induces a lot of ground balls over 50% ground ball rate. So if the D backs as a team could get that launch angle up, elevate the ball a little bit more, get some line drives, get some fly balls. That could be the key to beating Trevor Rogers. But if you're going to hit ground balls, you better be smoking them on the ground like you did against junk today, or I guess yesterday of the brew crew. But after looking at that pitching matchup, I do want to touch on really quickly, just the D back schedule going forward because the D backs just finished. I think the toughest part of their schedule, it doesn't exactly lighten up coming up, but it is a little bit easier than what the D backs just faced because coming up, the D-backs have the Marlins, who I think are feisty. And even though both their offensive pitching hasn't been great this year, the Marlins are like 6-7 and seven on the year. Like, they're near a 500 team. Like, you can't sleep on them. The Cardinals, despite their record, are still loaded with talent. They still got Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, a bunch of young talent. Maybe the best rookie in Major League Baseball right now with Jordan Walker. I know Corbin Carroll loved to say something about that. But I think, I think Jordan Walker has a hit in every game he's played in so far in his young career. So, um... Yeah, that's pretty good. So you got the Marlins next. You got the Cardinals. And then you got the Padres after that. So your next three series are all against feisty or really good teams. And then after the Padres, your schedule really lines up. Like if the D-backs can end the next three series with a winning record, like I don't know how many games that is. Let's just assume there's nine games between those three series I just mentioned. The D-backs can go five and four in those nine games. The D-backs have a real chance then to go on a run because if what we're seeing from the D-backs so far from this early stretch of the season is real and the D-backs are just, maybe they're not a division winner, but they're better than the bad teams in Major League Baseball and they're definitely a 500 team and they should win the games that they should win. Then you look at the 
series after the three series I just named, the series after that Padres series, because again, you don't play the Padres until August after this series in April. So after the Padres series, here's who the D-backs play next. Now, I don't want to look too far ahead into the schedule, but that's what I was doing today as I was prepping for this podcast. So as the D-backs enter May after the Padres, this is who they play. They play the Royals, the Rockies, the Rangers, the Nationals, the Marlins, the Giants, the A's, and then the Pirates. So I know I just named eight series after that Padres series, but you look at those eight series and you're like, man, the D-backs can go on a run because none of those teams really scare you. The best team I just mentioned there was probably the Giants, who I said all offseason, I think the D-backs are better than the San Francisco Giants. So these next three series are going to be the toughest for the Arizona Diamondbacks. But if they could get through these next three series with a winning record, as they enter May, I think the D-backs could go on a run and really Shut up the naysayers. I mean, I don't know if you could shut up the naysayers after a month of winning games because apparently my coworker was telling me today, games don't matter the first three months of a baseball season. Winning these games don't matter. Like that, that was a crazy take to me. Winning games doesn't matter. If you have a friend in your life that's poo pooing this D back standing, the D backs record and saying winning games don't matter, just laugh in their face because go show them the standings from last year, the last 10 years, the last hundred years of Major League Baseball. It always comes down to the final games of the season. You play 162 games, and every team is still within one to three games of the uh, of each other by the end of the year. It always comes down to the final couple weeks of the season. And guess what? You will have less stress at the end of the season if you're ahead of the other teams because you won your games earlier in the year. So don't ever let anyone tell you winning games early in the season doesn't matter. And that's it for this edition of the Locked On Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. Thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. Make your second listen of the day, the Locked On Fantasy Baseball podcast with Matt and Dom, who will keep you up to date all season with fantasy baseball news, strategies, and analysis. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy, doses.